Welcome, Feel Good Fathers. I am so excited to have uh, with me today, Graham Cochran. Uh, he's, we have been working together and I'm really delighted to introduce him to you. A couple of stats, things that are important to know. Number one, he's the creator of the Million Dollar Life Giving Business uh, Formula. You can find that on his website. He's the host of the Graham Cochran Show, which is a top 0.5% podcast, according to Listen Notes, which is a fantastic accomplishment. And I think the thing that I'm really excited to to get my hands into and to read this book, his upcoming book, Rebel, Find Yourself by Not Following the Crowd, which will be re- released September 3rd. 2024. Uh, there'll be links and stuff like that in the show notes. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, pumped to be here, Jay. Awesome. Um, a, a couple of weeks ago when we were chatting, uh, we brought up this concept of the family vision planning meeting and you were talking about what this was and how you had brought your daughters. Can you, can we just jump right into like what this was? I'm, I'm really interested in the tactical application of this concept. Yeah. So, you know, every new year, my wife and I have historically taken some time away to just do a little bit of intentional planning, right? Nothing really out of the ordinary. Um, when the kids were really young, it was like, uh, one night when we finally just wrestled them to bed and like got a bottle of wine and like collapsed on the sofa and exhaustion. And and we're like, we're just going to spend this one night trying to be a little intentional about our year. And, And the two questions we would ask at minimum were, what worked last year and what didn't work. And we'd always start with what worked. <laughs> so we would start with something positive because there's a million things in the, when the early ages, you know, the kids were really young where we just, everything seemed like it wasn't working. So we had forced ourselves to start with what worked. Um, and that would be like a, almost a discovery process. You know, you know, a year can go by and you forget like all the good things that happened, especially mm-hmm. when you're, you know, young parents, um, So we'd start with that and then we'd get to the what didn't work. And that could be anything from like, you know, we didn't really have consistent date nights, so that didn't work. Or um, the kids' bedtime routine didn't work. Or, you know, my travel was too much. That didn't work. Or or whatever it was. Like we would just share. And sometimes they weren't just related to the family. They were just related to like, like Shay would, my wife would be like, you know, my friendships didn't work last year. I just pretty much felt isolated. And so they might be personal. They might be family related. And just answering those two questions is really profound because it doesn't look for solutions as much as it just is a state of the union um, of like, hey, this worked, let's do more of that this year. This didn't work, okay, let's at another time try to see if we can solve this or be intentional. So we'd always done something like that at minimum, an evening, and and usually when the kids got a little older, we'd make a little family trip, um, just get an Airbnb and go away for a couple of nights and just try to make sure there was a place that had at least a separate room that Shay and I could do some of this planning together or a balcony or something. But this year, my daughters are 14 and 11 as of this taping. Um, and I thought, you know what? What if we brought them into this? Like, ask them to contribute to these questions because they're old enough to know like, hey, this isn't working in our family or this is working. And I was actually curious to know what their thoughts were. So that was the uh, the genesis of it. And we ended up mapping out a pretty intentional weekend. We got away. Um, we live in Tampa, Florida. We got away to Naples. Um, and booked a hotel and, and we, we had fun. Like we'd go out to the pool and we'd do the water slides and we'd have food and, and stuff. And, but we, we had a couple of sessions in the hotel room of just the reflecting on all the wins of, of last year and getting them to journal out their wins and their highlights of the year and sharing those and the, what worked and what didn't work. We had that all taped up on the wall, like with paper and I would get the kids involved. Like you guys be the scribes and you write it down and you know, my 14 year old contributed a lot more than my 11 year old. Part of that is age. Part of that is personality. My 11 year old is very shy and quiet, but we we got into like starting with the assessment, but then it really got into like, Hey, what are our values as a family? What does it mean to be a Cochrane? And I, I, I didn't lead it. I asked them like, what do you think it means to be a Cochrane? Um, what comes up for you? And that was very interesting. And we talked it out and just walk through some intentional things that I felt like this is either going to go really great and it's going to be a huge bonding opportunity, or this is going to suck because they're going to be bored out of their minds and they're going to be like, what are we doing? Like, this is way too intense. But uh, on the whole, it was a total win. And I would just say um, it was a unifying moment where we felt very close as a family. Uh, and it was, it was instructive for me how well it worked. What do you think would be the sort of the, like on a specific level, the, the big, the big aha moment there, 
a handful of questions in my mind, just on the whole experience would be, um, and this would be related to the aha moment would be the first one would be, Hey, you've got two different personalities. Were there any specific tactics you use to kind of draw out the introvert? You know, typically it's, it's not hard to rein in an extrovert and you can kind of steer them where you want them to go. It's like, you're kind of like a cannoneer and they're the cannon. But yeah. the, I guess we'll just start with like, with the young one, where there, was there anything in particular um, that you did to kind of draw out her personality and contribution? Yeah, that's a good question. I think for her, my youngest, her name is Vera. I had to, I had to lead her a little bit more. Like she, her biggest response always is, uh, I don't know. You ask her a sure. question. I don't know. <laughs> and that's just her default. And it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, it's easier for her to say that she doesn't have to think. And, and part of her, you know, her challenge is like being able to be aware of what she's feeling. If it's an emotion, uh, be aware of her desire. She's very much like a people pleaser. I want everyone else to be happy. So she rarely thinks about what she actually wants. So she's like, I don't want to deal with it. I'll just say, I don't know. And, and that's not a good enough answer in our house. So we, we try to push gently. If you push too hard, it becomes like really weird and she shuts down more, but I had to just lead her a little bit and like give her some examples. Well, you know, Vera, what about how awesome you went to your first like overnight church camp last summer and like you were really nervous, but when you came back, you said it was amazing. So wouldn't you say that was one of your highlights from last year? And she's like, oh yeah, you're right. That was really cool. So I kind of had to give her some examples that at least I knew to get her going. Um, and, you know, she's living in the shadow of her older sister who's very much all the things in a good way, but she, she'll just be like, you know, Chloe's got it. So I'll just like, she's filling the room. I'll just retreat. But we try to make sure there was, you know, some space for her, some that's focused attention on her. Um, but at the same time, I wasn't expecting a lot from her. And then I didn't, I told her, look, you don't have to like have a lot of ideas or feel like you have to talk a lot. I'm just glad that you're here. And this is gonna be an opportunity. If there's something that's really important for you, or if you, if something comes up for you that you think we should know as a family, I want you to feel the freedom to share it. And if not, just be here with us, journal, whatever thoughts come to mind. Um, we're just happy you're here. And um, I think she just needed to feel like she was included and she didn't have to contribute if she didn't want to. Got it. Do you think that would adjust? Do you think that would adjust as you're trying to draw her out more? Like if you were to do this again in the next year? Probably like she probably is, is a, like, I'll hang back and see how things go kind of person. But when, when she's comfortable, um, she'll, she's very talkative and very bubbly and like very funny. And so we know that in other areas. So I think this was just like new and, and probably a little weird to her. I mean, it was weird. <laughs> it's not something we do every day. We're not, we're not the most like intentional family. Um, we don't all have journals every morning together. We don't give each other prompts. Like this, this is a little out of the ordinary for the fam not out of the ordinary for Shay and I as individuals and as a couple, but this was kind of new. So I imagine if we did even like a mini one this summer, like we're going to probably do a mini one six months into the year. I imagine she'll be a little more comfortable then and probably next year in, in the new year, even more comfortable. If, if we're talking to, um, feel good fathers and they're, and they're relatively new young fathers, you know, cause we've had, we, we both have, you know, I've got the new, my, my new one-year-old, I have my 11-year-old, uh, your, your kids are a little bit more aged. For the new fathers out there, what, how would we, what would you suggest that they do in, in particular to kind of start this practice? So I've always struck, for instance, I've, this year was the first year I actually did a year in review and it's just like, it's just never, I, I reflected on it, but it was when I went into it, I, I kept going back years. I think I, I went back like 10 years. I, I I live very much by my calendar so I could find out like all the major events in the past 10 years. And I did some research on that. And that was, it was very interesting to kind of remind myself of everything that I was going on uh, in my life. But if you're a new father, like what, what would you suggest they do? I think for me, the principle that I'm trying to accomplish is living life intentionally by design. Mm. And so that comes with just awareness. I think awareness is the most powerful thing. I don't, I'm not really too worried about the framework of what we do with that awareness. I feel like there's a lot of freedom and creativity there. Um, so I guess what I would want to be teaching if I'm, I'm a young father again, and my kids are really young, it, it might start with just at the dinner table, asking a version of the what worked, what didn't work um, from the, the day. Like, 
you know, people call this high and low from the day, but like, hey, what was what was the best part of your day so far? You know, and get them to think about, oh, well, you know, we did this cool thing in school or, you know, my kids forever was like snack time was the best part of the day. You know, it's like, okay, really? There's nothing better than snack time. Um, but just whatever they, getting them to think about their day for a second, just think back a few hours if they can, what was a highlight for them? And then um, what, what you know, you could call it a low or just like what, what didn't work today or what, what wasn't the most fun today for you? And however you want to phrase it, just getting, getting them to think it's the same principle, only thinking about a whole year is very hard for a young kid, but training them on a daily basis, or even if you just go, go on an activity or a play date and you come back and assess that, hey, what was the best part of hanging out with, with Johnny and, and Susie? Like, and then what was the, the not so fun part? Getting them to learn how to reflect that's all we're trying to do. I think you could start with that really, really young. And if you do that regularly, it'd be weird at first, but if you do that regularly as a family, um, then that becomes not only not weird, but like obvious that you should look back and reflect on like some parts of your day or week or, or season of life are going to be great and some part not so great. And just can we at least identify those? Then I think they'll start to realize that they're living way more intentionally by default because they're aware of what they don't want to do more of or experience and aware of what they do want more of without us having to like give them here's here's these journal prompts I want you to answer and here's this five point framework I created that I want you to go through. Um, it's almost more organic. I I particularly like that from the especially because of the the value perspective of what you're creating, this idea of each person has their own personality, their own desires, their own you know, uh, what they're creating. And, and I thought, you know, that was really represented in was, uh, Vera, you're talking about walking Vera through the experience, right? Like, Hey, you're going to be a bit more quiet, a little bit more reserved in these capacities. And it's cool. Just, just kind of hang out with us and do that. I'm, I'm particularly interested in as well, the next step of when you first started this practice. So I, I wasn't super clear and I, and I think this might be interesting. Was this, uh, this year in review, was this something that you had been doing previous to your young kids or was it really you collapsed <laughs> with with Shay on the couch at the end of one day with young kids and we're just like let's do a year in review why not uh what's the story there yeah i i think we were both pretty intentional people beforehand like when we were newlyweds this is kind of how we were um but then when we before we had kids i think we were, were always talking Shay and I are always talking. And so it was more of like an everyday, like throughout the day, date night, morning in the car. We're just reflecting without realizing it. And I think when we had kids and we were exhausted in those early years, we stopped. We didn't have the energy to, we we're just trying to keep up with life, you know? Mm. And so I think it was like when maybe my oldest was four or my youngest was one, that we were like, we have got to like make some changes, you know, like we're, we're just treading water and it doesn't feel great. And I know it's a hard season, but I'm sure it could be, I'm sure we could do this a little better. And so that was when I think we started to do it intentionally in January of like, okay, let's just look back at last year, what worked, what didn't work. And those are the only two questions we allowed ourselves. We didn't go too far down the road of like, having to have a solution, but just if we could just answer those two questions. And honestly, that was all the energy we had to do was just answer those two questions. So that's really where our annual review started was probably when the kids were four and one. That's awesome. So let's take that. Let's go to the next logical step. So we've done this year in review. As we're talking about this, I, I keep thinking about Tim Ferriss's, his whole practice, right? He's like, once you do this, then you author and create these things. So we're now new feel good fathers. We've got this practice. We're, we're trying it out. What do we do with this information? Yeah, I think, you know, if you have a list of what, um, what worked, you know, just take a look at that. And, and that's probably the easier list to work with and say, okay, cool. How can we do more of, of this? So for example, if, um, if you took a trip with your your wife um and it was just a great time and it was needed especially when the kids are young and you're like we had the grandma and grandma grandmother in town watching the kids and we were able to get out for three nights or something one weekend and it was just a really good time if that was what worked last year or on the list you should do that again or like yeah let's let's make that a priority or, or a version of that a priority right and put that on the calendar um because we already know it's it's a win for us 
So how can we make sure the year doesn't go by without that happening again? If it's on the negative side, like what didn't work, we would probably take a look at that list and then, which was always way longer <laughs> than the what worked list, by the way. These days it's flipped. Like, you know, praise the Lord, this this year, like the what worked was mega long and what didn't work was very short. But I tried to like tell our girls, like when y'all were young, when we were new parents and and also when we were broke, like always like the three things at the same time, like young kids, new parents, newly married, no money. It's always tough. I was like, the list was flop, flip-flopped. It was always what, what, what didn't work was really long. It's overwhelming, at least it was for us. So we would just look at that and say, okay, let's just pick one for now that we want to work on. Like, just just let's pick one. And we would just pick the one that felt like the most pressing and the most that we're most drawn to. For example, one year it was, man, what work, what didn't work? We rarely went out on a date. And we were like shit. We always said we we're ships passing in the night. Like we'd high five each other and like we were better roommates than we were married uh, partners. And so we're like, that that didn't work. So what can we do about date nights? Um, how can we make that a priority? Like maybe we don't get to anything else on the list this year, but if we could just pick one thing off the what didn't work and improve it a bit, that'd be a win. So for us, we just found a, a teenager in the neighborhood um, and we asked her, hey, can we just make you uh, like our babysitter every week? You pick the night that you're you're always free. So it doesn't have to be on the weekend. If like Tuesday nights are good for you, we'll make our date night Tuesday night because that works for you. Can you just come to our house every Tuesday at this time? We will pay you on retainer. And we made a commitment to that, even if Shay and I didn't have any date ideas or any money to go on a date, it was like a built-in, like guaranteed, sometimes we would say hi for the first time walking out the door you know, when the kids are screaming and the babysitter's watching them and we wouldn't have anywhere to go. We just walk around the neighborhood sometimes. And at least we had like two hours of time for us. And that was like maybe the only change we made that year off of our list of what didn't work, but that had a profound impact on us having more opportunity to connect. You know, date nights every week are huge, I think, to fight for because the more often you have date nights, it's like the more at bats you have. You don't have to have a home run date night every single week because you know, you've got so many of them. So you can afford to have a, a rough date night where you have the hard conversations and it's not fun. It's not romantic, but you need to talk about something important because there's no pressure because it's not your one precious date night. It's we'll do another one next week. And so that was a big turning point for us in our marriage. And that all came from just a long list of what didn't work and just picking the one that seemed most interesting or pressing to us to work on. There are so many, I think, really great points to highlight here. And I think as we discuss them, we'll, we'll kind of, I want to address like that aha moment. So the first thing that really I pulling out for me, for me here, that was interesting was as you were doing this practice more and more and refining sort of like avoiding or moving away from things you didn't want and moving towards things you did want, the, the list actually flipped. And I was thinking about, you know, uh, negativity bias, which is something we all have, right? Your, your brain's like the negativity bias so that these are the things that I need to avoid to survive. But through this intention, you constructed this thriving environment, which I thought was really cool. And I thought that would be, and not only did you have that, but you were open and sharing that with, with the girls, which is great. You know, I think that's a great, a great learning. That's a, that's a pretty significant aha moment, I think. And it aligns a lot with what you were saying about the intention. You're intentionally building the family. You're intentionally building this practice. You're intentionally helping, um, you know, helping your girls, helping your wife figure out how to live this intentional life and then showing them the fruits with, with your wisdom and experience. And that was really great. I particularly think it's, it's really interesting, this concept of the at-bats with dates, that if you have more regularly scheduled at-bats with your partner, then you're going to be able to have um, more meaningful conversations. And I would chalk up negative confrontational, let's fix this thing moments as these are meaningful, you know, mm -hmm. as opposed to just the, or just, just the have a great time, have fun, sure. you know, be good lovers, that whole, that whole element. I thought that was really great. Um, so you're all about intention, your new book rebel, right? finding out who you are by not following the crowd, you know, finding yourself. Let's, let's kind of step through. Cause I think that this as a con as an idea is related conceptually to this intentional life. Hmm. So let, let's kind of like, what is, what is this part? What is, let's walk through this for feel good fathers. Yeah. So the, the concept is pretty simple. I mean, I think all of us at some point feel stuck or frustrated or disappointed with how life is going and for me that's been at different seasons at age 26 lost two jobs in one year 
during the recession, pandemic, or you know, not pandemic, global recession, uh, on food stamps. I married another baby. I'm like, what the heck am I doing? That was like a major disappointment. Um, it happened in my mid thirties. Like, it, like there's different stages where you're like, okay, this was really fun and fulfilling, but now it's not. Like, oh my gosh, what am I doing? Where whenever you feel stuck or disappointed. There's, it's just like a warning light. There's something to look at. And for me, I've, in my experience, I have found that more often than not, the frustrations in life come from living out of alignment with who you were designed to be. And, and the way I think about it is at, at my house, in my pantry, I have an espresso machine uh, and a blender right next to each other. And the espresso machine is like, you know, pour the beans in the top. It's an automatic espresso machine because I ain't got time to like fiddle with things but at least it grinds fresh beans with every cup you know you pour it in the top it grinds it and then it spews out espresso coffee cappuccino whatever you want it the way a lot of times we live our lives is like my espresso machine as if if it looked next to it at the blender and said like well I want to make a smoothie like why can't I make a smoothie? I'm just like the blender. I've got a hole in the top where you put food in I've got a blade that spins around and grinds it up like Come on, let's do this. But you and I both know, right, if we put a banana and some frozen strawberries and some protein powder and some almond milk in the top of my espresso machine and shove it in there and press the button, like it's going to be a mess. Like at, at worst, it's going to, at best, it's going to taste awful. You know, at best, it'll taste awful. At worst, the machine breaks. Yeah. And this is how we're living our lives is we're breaking under this misalignment of this, I see something that's working in someone else why can't I do that or have that or be like that? And, and it's heartbreaking because I get it. There's beautiful things you see in other people. There's things that you do, Jay, that are beautiful that I could see and go, why can't I be like Jay? But I wasn't designed to be exactly like Jay. And so I think this, the sweet spot comes when you live in alignment with how you're created to be. And that's the question is, well, well how was I designed? Like, who am I? And that's really what I do in the book is, is walk you through a coaching process of trying to discover for the first time for some of us rediscover for the first time in a long time for some of us who we are what lights us up and this involves everything from dreaming to vision to inner story audit and your your heart like to figuring out your values like stuff that maybe we are doing subconsciously but a lot of times we're just not because we're busy and if you're if you're a father of young kids you ain't got time to think about all those things you're just going through life trying to do the best you can and so it's important to figure this out because that's where the freedom comes. Once you figure out who you are, then you can really step into what you're called to do. And who you are is not going to be determined by just being like everybody else. Like you really have to realize I got to rebel against the conformity of the world as a culture, rebel against trying to be like everybody else and like figure out who am I? Not so that I can be a jerk or or not be a part of the the, the, the community, but for a moment, I ha I can't find my identity by looking at other people. It will never happen. It comes from looking at the way God designed me, and that's going to manifest itself through a few different things that are pretty easy to start to take inventory of. I think if you're a feel-good father, uh, a, a big piece of what you're doing is kind of starting down this path. And it, as you were talking through this, I was really reflecting on some of the conversations I had when I was in uh, video games. So I ended up making games for about 10 years. And I remember just at that time, there, there were certain elements of personal development, like I'm hearing growth, personal development, doing that kind of internal work a lot. And I had been doing some version um, as an 80s, 90s kid of looking at myself, thinking about my spirituality, thinking about God, all, all this kind of stuff and stepping through in the capacity I could. And then I hit my, my mid to late 20s. And I remember just kind of sitting there and saying, uh, how, I, I never gave thought to meaning. I never gave thought to purpose. I, I never really gave thought. Well, I always gave thought to intention. It's something that I've done a lot. So I dreamed about making video games since I was eight. And so then like doing that like 20 years later was, was, you know, the culmination of that dream, which was amazing. But I, you know, as I'm sitting there, I, I keep thinking about what is the key? Like I have an answer what I think the key is to figuring out this intention what you were designed to do, who you were designed to be. Uh, what is your answer to that? Like, what would be the simple way to figure that out? Yeah, I mean, it's both simple and complex. <laughs> so um, I don't want to, I don't want to dismiss how hard this work is, right? It, and it's also ongoing. 
I I really believe that the secret is is it begins with dreaming. You mentioned your dream of video games. I I really believe it. That's that's the biggest and, and brightest clue as to who you are is what what dreams light you up. And because here's what happens, Jay, is something that I call the identity crisis intersection. Uh, our identity gets attached to something, usually a dream. Uh, and that can be great. It can be a dream to make video games. It can be a dream to get married and have kids. It can be a dream to live in a different country or live a certain lifestyle. Um, then that dream dies at some point. You lose the job. You get the divorce that you didn't expect. You know, the economy shifts and your services are no longer needed. Um, you have a health crisis and you can't do the thing you once wanted to do or someone in your family has a health crisis and you need to take care of them. And so your, your time changes. Dream dies. And so now you're at an intersection. You have a fork in the road. You can go left or right. To the left is where most of us go, which is we just conform. It's just get back in line. You know, I dreamt of doing video games. I dreamt of having a great marriage. But you know what? The video game career died. My marriage died. I'm just going to get back in line with everybody else. I feel stupid for having a dream. I feel a little embarrassed or ashamed that it fell apart or I'm exhausted from trying so hard and it never coming to fruition. So I'm just going to go be like everybody else and just live my life, whatever that looks like for you. Conform in the way you think about relationships. I'm not going to get married again. Conform in the way you think about career. I'm just going to get a job. I should just be grateful for a job. Um, that's one choice. The other choice, and this is the harder choice, but the choice I think sets you free is to dream again. Hmm. To dream again. It's either you find a new dream, an, uh, another version of the dream, and that's hard. Like if it's a relationship, it's to try to dream for another healthy relationship again. If it's a career that died for me, for example, my first identity crisis intersection was age 22. Uh, I had been spending the last four years actively pursuing getting a record deal and being a rock star. I thought I had a legitimate shot, made records with some producers in Nashville, shopping around the labels, playing stupid bars and doing all this stuff. And um, when all the deals were drying up, like the, the, the potential deals were coming in, they weren't real deals at all. They were like development deals, which means like, we're, we're not going to pay you. We'll sign you and let you keep fiddling around. And if you make some money, then we'll throw money at you kind of deal. And I was engaged to be married. And I was like, no, I need a real job. And when I realized that like my, my options were just coming up short, I had to make a decision and I, ch I chose, I think wisely in that moment to focus on getting married and getting, getting some income and taking care of my new wife. What I didn't choose well was I just chose to give up dreaming altogether mm. like that. Mm. I'm just going to be a good husband, have kids, go to church, pay my taxes, keep my head down. Um, and I thought that I would be happy. I convinced myself I'd be happy um, by just giving up on dreaming because it, it was just too hard. It was too painful to, to think about trying again or trying something new. Um, so for me, it's taken years uh, to like, I've had multiple dreams since then that have been different, building my first business in the music space, building another business in, in the business coaching space, now dreaming to be an, an, an author and a speaker, like publishing my first book two years ago was like a big step into a new dream. And it's like, man, this is scary. But it wasn't satisfying to just conform. And so I think to long answer to your short but profound question is, I don't think dreaming is the whole thing. I think it's the doorway in which we begin to walk through this process of self-discovery because what you dream about, and dreams maybe isn't language people like, it's just desire. It's what do you, what do you want to be, want to have, want to do? If you're actually honest with yourself and there's no there's no one listening, no one paying attention, and you don't feel any obligation to should or shouldn't want a desire, which is really hard depending on your, your upbringing, your childhood, the, the culture you're a part of. Some of us have a harder time with allowing ourselves to press into our desires, but I think that desire and dream is a clue, a really, really good clue, 30,000 foot view mm -hmm. um, that needs more work, but it's a great starting point to figuring out identity. What steps would you take to build that muscle? If we're thinking about dreaming as um, the process of being a person who goes to the gym and works out to build up their muscles, right? If, if that's what we think of dreaming is, what would be the steps or like, maybe not the steps, but like, I, I think in the spirit of the question, you know, it's like, what would you do to kind of grow that muscle? What would you do to get better at dreaming? 
Oh, that's a great question. I mean, it would be just like the gym metaphor. You you wouldn't start with the biggest weight and the heaviest weight in the gym. Um, or if you're running, you wouldn't just go run a marathon tomorrow. So I would start with the little dreams. What are the smaller dreams that that you could activate? Um, and dreams can be, I like, I remember telling my dad when I was writing the, the book, right? Um, and I'm getting a lot of this stuff on paper. And I sent my dad and my mom like early drafts of each chapter because they were they really wanted to read it. And he was really enjoying it until he got to the dream chapter. And he got really frustrated. He's like, I don't know, I don't know what I would dream about. Like, I don't, it's I don't have big dreams. You know, I'm 67, like I've lived my life. I don't have big dreams. And my dad's a little like dramatic at times about these things. And so I was trying to break it down for him. I'm like, Dad, don't think that big. Think small. Like, I know you've said you've always wanted to learn Italian because you're you're from Italy and He's spoken other languages before, but like, you know, that's, that's a dream. Like, it'd be cool to just like sign up for an Italian course or, you know, get Duolingo and just, just practice it and then go to Italy and try your, like, you're not trying to be fluent or be like some amazing translator, but you just want to speak a little Italian. That is an example of a smaller dream that you could, you could lift like some light weights for the analogy. Um, for, for me, it could be like, I want to go to the movies in the middle of the day and watch a movie by myself when everyone else is at work. Like that doesn't sound like a dream, like a capital D dream, but that's that's something that Graham actually like likes to do, right? And I remember the first time I let myself, gave myself permission. This is, it's really a language of permission. Gave myself permission to go do something I really wanted to do. And if you do that and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so scandalous, but it feels so good, you know, like then you're, you're working up that muscle of, okay, I can, I, I am worthy of being able to pursue some things that for me would just fill me up and give me life. For They're not productive. They don't pay money necessarily. No one else has to approve, but it's for me. And it, it reminds me that I'm a human that deserves to, to do fun things. Like when I was a kid, I just wanted to do fun things just because they'd be fun. That's, what, that's the language of dreaming it, it, to start out if you're getting stuck. Start with those small little things. And, and then you will start to build out a bigger list of like, I, I want to be president one day, or I want to, like I have a friend who, whose mission in life is to redeem the health of the world. That's a big capital D dream. But you know, it started with like, I want to learn about heart rate variability and I want to like get in shape myself. And I want, you know, it starts somewhere, but he's got big, big dreams and we're not conditioned to dream. In our culture, like we love dreaming in that we watch movies and read books about people who have dreams and they pursue their dreams and we, we that, that stirs our heart. But we don't actually live in a culture that supports dreaming as much as we talk about it. We live in a culture that supports just keep your head down, be like everybody else, because um, we're all bitter and we're all disenchanted with life. And so you don't want to piss off those people when you start to chase your dreams and, and realize them, big or small, because they'll the wolves will come out. Uh, even um, from your closest, your inner circle sometimes, because they're just, they're just jealous and it stirs something in their heart because they want to dream too. I, I really loved the, you, you brought in this idea that we have these heroes from our popular culture, you know, movies, TV shows, uh, champions. Like I think of this, our sports champions, you know, we, we have an obsession with sports champions in the U S uh, that there's a misalignment between the people that we revere in some capacity and uh who we allow ourselves to be i i, I really um it, it's kind of funny you know as a as a millennial i think we're i think we're roughly we're, we're kind of near the same age you know I, I think i think that's how i would look at that uh i think of the messages i think part of that disenfranchise would be the messages growing up of like do what you're passionate about hmm. you know and i and i and i think one of the challenges that doesn't exist today and I'd love to hear your take on this. It doesn't exist today is that today, if you can think about it, you can pretty much build a business around it. You know, I, I think it was about seven or eight years ago, I was listening to Gary Vaynerchuk talk and he was like, if you want to be the Etsy candle maker thing, and that's what you dream about. And you have, I think his thing is like, you got hours between seven at night and two in the morning, do it. Like <laughs> just like yeah. the internet will allow it to happen. Right. Um, I, I'd love to kind of hear your take on, um, cause I think this misalignment concept is something that you brought up in the past. What, what contributes to this? What contributes to, in, on one half, the killing of the dream. Hmm. And then on the other half, this misalignment between our aspirations, our heroes and the people that we revere and what we do with our own life. 
man. I mean, it depends. Um, Gary's right. Like, this is an age where you can literally monetize any passion. I mean, that's my first book, How to Get Paid for What You Know, is like, like here's the model. Like, literally, if you want to get paid to talk about eating pizza, there's guys that are doing that. You can do it. Um, but that, but knowing the, I mean, I teach this for a living. Knowing the model and and doing it are a different thing. Believing that you can do it, believing that you're you're, it's good and right for you to do it are a different thing. And that there's a, a million reasons why that's the case. It could be your parents. You know, I, I just was hanging out in Arizona this weekend with a, a new friend whose parents just wanted him to go to law school, and he didn't want to go to law school. And when he finally like gave up that dream because he wanted to become an entrepreneur, they just were like, "What's wrong with you?" Like even though he chose his dream, it still messes with him a decade later because his parents still are a little disappointed with him. That's a powerful cocktail, right? Of like a desire, but then my parents approval that I never got, even if they are like, okay, I see you're successful at it. Like, okay, I guess you're fine. They're still that like, they never really wanted me to do this. And we all want approval, whether it's a parental figure, like an actual parent or a, a you know, father figure or mother figure in your life, whoever in influenced you, that's messes with a lot of people. Some of it is just good old fashioned insecurity and fear. Like, okay, like I believe I can do this. Graham says I can monetize my passion. Gary V says I can do it. Anything's possible, but I just am so darn afraid. And for some people, if it's like me, I'm a guy that's afraid of failure. What will people say if it doesn't work out? Because they'll judge me and they'll point their finger at me. Look at him; it didn't work out. And that stems from my age twenty-two, my music career. Like I told everyone, I was going to be a rock star. I didn't know if I would like be mega famous or make a lot of money, but I was going to either be mega famous, like Taylor Swift famous, or or go broke trying. Um, but at least I would be doing it professionally. And when that didn't happen, I was like, "Oh crap! I've told everybody my whole life this is what I'm going to do," and I was so embarrassed. So that like now my fear is fear of failure and embarrassment. Other people. Um, it's just the fear that it won't make enough money. And like they just, their, their value of security is so high. They're like, I, I just can't risk. What if I, it doesn't pay the bills and I don't want to be broke or I don't want to feel that pressure. And that could come from a variety of reasons. So there's a million reasons to answer your question. Um, we can easily, all of us can want a thing. And I think desire is a starting block. But to have the guts to move to the thing um, is another thing entirely. That's why, like in the book, like I start with dreaming. Step two is to establish like the vision that you have for your life. Like dreaming is powerful. What's more powerful are details, right? Like what would it look like three years from now? If, you've, if this have been the best three years of your life, like what does that mean to you on like the day-to-day -day life, right? Because then it becomes real. You're like, oh, I can picture that. And when you can picture something, we desire it even more. But even then, that's not strong enough. The third step that I teach in the book is you have to break the negative thoughts, the negative mindsets, the negative patterns. You have to do an, an audit of your inner story, the story you tell yourself that you don't even realize is there because you could have the best intentions, but if you can't like win in the mind, you're going to self-sabotage in one of a bajillion different ways. You know, There's something that uh, Gay Hendrick calls the upper limit problem that you can want it all the life, but it's like a thermostat. You get past that temperature of whatever that, that thermostat in your life is set at, and you'll self-sabotage and bring it right back down to whatever ceiling you have allowed in terms of money that you've allowed into your life or love or acceptance or whatever. We all have one. <laughs> and so it's an upper limit problem that we, it, it's not a real limit, but it's one we set on ourselves subconsciously. So that's, you got to deal with that, you know, and there's so many other things that go with it. So it, it is hard work. And that's why in the book, I try to like give you the steps so you can, and there's like action steps and there's, there's even a reader's guide at the end if you want to go through it in the group. But like, I try to make it really approachable of like, you could actually go work this out, but you're not going to read the book and like be a rebel and be walking in your identity. Like it is a lifetime of work um, that's going to be ongoing as our identity shifts and changes. But I think dreaming is actually the easiest part and we suck at that but right. it's follow through that's e even harder than that <laughs> that, that does sound like good news but that's just the reality of it for sure i think that I, I think the one thing i'm taking away from this conversation i think feel good fathers can, can pay attention to is what is the work what's the weight that you can lift that makes it worthwhile you know when i when i think back to the year in review and i think back to 
um, all our conversations uh, here, life by, living life by design, setting the intention for you and your family, you know, in the beginning, you know, the sacrificing after failure and, and conforming, it's like, you know, what, what I really feel that we can take away from this together as, as the feel good father community is what, what is worth pursuing? What's it worth to us? What's it worth to our spouse? What's it worth to our kids? What's it worth to the world? Um, so, uh, thank you, Graham. Is there anything, uh, any, any final comments, thoughts, or ways to get a hold of you that we can, we can leave the audience with? Yeah, I would just say, um, just the, the, the young dads just hang in there, hang in there. It is, this is the hardest season is with young kids. I, I for sure. And so when it comes to your dreams and the things you're frustrated with that aren't in reality, the things you want to be in existence, like just have patience and know that it's going to probably be a seasonality thing for you. There's some dreams that even I still want that aren't going to be able to be realized for another six years or so until I'm an empty nester. And so just, just know that there's a season for everything and just hang in there. And just to your point, Jay, I think you said it beautifully, like lift the weight that's worth it to you in this season and, and start with that. Don't tackle it all at once. And honestly, I, I feel like my life is super messy all the time. I only reason I realize that I'm doing a half decent job is I'm, I'm seeing how other people interact with my kids and go, wow, your kids are amazing. And I'm like, oh, maybe I didn't screw them up that much. You know, and so it, right. it always, it's always felt like a mess. Like, I don't know what I'm doing the whole time, but that's the beauty of a, just an ounce of intentionality, an ounce of like, this, I think this is worth it. Just that alone can produce really remarkable results. Love it. Uh, Graham Cochran, everybody. Thanks for having me, Jay.